Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Writer's Edge. I am your host, Christy Stratus, and tonight we are talking in detail about writing LGBTQ fiction. And if you are not already subscribed to The Writer's Edge, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell. I am going to introduce our panelists now. I'm going to attempt to do it in 60 seconds or less, but everyone has a lot of awesome stuff that I want to say about them, so it may be a little bit longer than that. Uh, if each of you could wave when I say your name so we all know who the other person is. Uh, Alicia Sophia is a punk rocker from Pittsburgh, and she is now living on the West Coast, where she majored in creative writing, and she has always been a writer. Her debut novel is called 143. It's going to be published by Rhett Askew Publishing, and the pre-order goes live November 15th. If you are not part of our Facebook group, please join our Facebook group because we are going to post her pre-order link there. Uh, Heidi Cullinan writes positive outcome romances for LGBT characters struggling against insurmountable odds because she believes there's no such thing as too much happily ever after. Heidi is a two-time Rita finalist and her books have been recommended by Library Journal, USA Today, RT Magazine, and Publishers Weekly. KJ, KG McGregor was once a pollster and market research consultant, but now she is a multi-award winning author with approximately 26 books published. She is the winner of the Lambda Literary Award for Women's Romance and several Golden Crown Awards. And other honors include the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Royal Academy of Bards, the Alice B. Readers Appreciation Medal, and several Reader's Choice Awards. And finally, we have Radcliffe, who has written over oh. 50 romance and intrigue novels, dozens of short stories, and writing as L.L. Rand. She also has authored a paranormal romance series <clears throat> called The Midnight Hunters. And she also has edited over 15 queer anthologies. She has won many awards, and those include three Lambda Literary Awards, multiple Golden Crown Awards, and seven RWA Chapter Awards, plus the Dr. James Duggins Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award. She also founded Bold Strokes Books, Inc. in 2004, and is one of the world's largest independent LGBTQ publishing companies, and she remains President. So you see why I had to take a minute and a half there. It was really important. I am the author. I am Christy Stratus. You guys know me. I'm the author of the Dark Victoriana collection, and that includes the books Anatomy of a Darkened Heart and Brotherhood of Secrets. And my latest publication is a horror short story called The Subtlety of Terror. So I just want to tell you guys real quick before we begin that I did ask male authors as well to join this panel to make sure it was diverse. Um, we already have a very diverse panel, but uh, unfortunately we didn't have any responses from the male authors. So um, we have an amazing panel here tonight and I'm ready to get right into it. I'm very excited. Um, so let's get started. We can all jump in anytime. Um, so let's get started with the question of what themes make LGBTQ fiction speak to the right audience? And any of you is welcome to start. I'll jump. I'll jump. Great. Um, um, I, thought I thought about, about this question. question. Are you getting an echo or are, are we good? We're good? Um, I think that LGBT fiction speaks to a lot of audiences, not just LGBT people, because the themes that we write about are universal themes. There are some, of course, that are always specific to our fiction in particular, coming out, dealing with gender and sexual identity, um, issues of legality, the right to marry, the right for choice. So there are very specific things that, that signify our work, but I think there are many universal themes that we also deal with. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. 100%. Um, there, I would say my, my readers are completely all over the map. Um, I have, I, there, I think there's a lot of people who I write prime, I write so far I have written the lion's share of my work is, is entirely, almost entirely gay romance. There's some, like, there's some bisexual characters and some there's an asexual romance and I have uh, I have my first lesbian romance coming next year but the my, I'm known for gay romance and you there's a lot of assumptions about who my readers are and I can tell you that my readers are diverse like they're the and the the reason is because these stories don't speak they, they while they the representation is important because 
the, these stories need to be told, the resonance is there for everyone. And the reason there's a difference between representation being need to be spoken for everyone. And then there's the difference of resonance as those are two completely separate things. And they, they work together side by side and it's, it's, it's really cool to see how that comes down with readers. But I, I agree that there it's, it's, not, it's that there's important things that need to be told, but that every, the stories really are for everyone. I think the, um, one of the things that the whole country is talking about um, now is the urban and rural divide. And I think that is an especially important theme in uh, LGBT literature because it is harder to be queer in rural America. And, um, and I think our books need to, um, we need to consider at times who our, who our audience is and um, to the extent that we're obviously entertaining, but we are also, um, we're also writing books that we hope people will see themselves in. And, um, and it's good to, you know, for someone like me who lives in Nashville, um, I get out to rural Tennessee a lot and I see, I see very different people here from the ones that I knew when I lived in Miami, when I lived in Palm Springs. And um, I think that's, that's getting to be a bigger theme in some of the things that, that I'm plotting out for the next couple of years. Can I, can I jump on, on the tail, tail of that? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Alicia. Oh no, I'm trying to, my, I'm trying to charge my phone, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I actually also, I live in rural America. I live in upstate New York on a farm in a, in a very rural area. And I'm fortunate New York is a pretty blue state, but um, I live, you know, openly as a, as a queer and, and everyone here knows that. And I'm actually writing a series set in this area, uh, a medical romance series that features the town that I live in. And I, I think that I, I agree with KG absolutely that we need to reach populations worldwide who who need to see themselves in a positive way. And I think that that's what one of the most important aspects of queer publishing and queer fiction is reaching the disenfranchised, the those who are isolated and separated and don't have a voice and can't see themselves anywhere in the world. We have always fulfilled that function in our fiction for the last. 60 years when it was identifiable as such. And I think we, we really need to continue to do that. There's definitely a, I would also agree with the, the rural, uh, the, the need for the rural. Um, I get a lot of, if I get mail from, if I get reader mail, a lot of times it is from rural readers. They often find my books in libraries and um, they, they're often um, older um, and they don't necessarily have access to, because they're usually reading print books and they don't have access to the same kind of technology or they don't, they don't have as much income. So maybe they have access, but they don't have as much income to buy as many eBooks or to buy an e-reader or to buy a smartphone. And so that, that there are librarians willing to shell these books in places, rural places, and that there are so many more books means a lot to, to a lot of people. And, and to not just queer people too, to people who I, I get letters from people who identify to who just identify as feeling different and and in reading books about queer people, they they feel they 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 begin to understand themselves too and they also it's just there's there's a lot that's to be said for having this literature out there i remember being alicia did you want to jump in yeah <clears throat> sorry i remember being a teenager and going to barnes and noble oh, i think she's muted seem to be I'm muted unmuted. alicia now it says muted let's see if i can unmute you having a bit of an issue on that end is it working? No. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh no. 
Okay. Um, we will move on, but Alicia, keep trying and we'll definitely get to you when you're able to be heard. Something must have happened when you were trying to charge your phone. Um, so for the moment, let's go forward. Um, first of all, the next question that I wanted to ask, you have already answered um, to some degree, but I would like to dig just a little bit deeper into this. Um, I've seen quite a difference of opinion on this one. Um, is it important to write LGBTQ fiction the same as for any other target audience, um, almost ignoring the sexuality element, or is it important to include elements and struggles unique to the target audience? And I know that we already um, dealt with this a little bit. Um, I have seen authors who are LGBTQ say, um, no, it needs to be treated the same as anything else. Um, but what I'm hearing tonight is it is really important for people to be able to really identify and feel that maybe their struggles are heard and maybe they experience the same thing as, as others. I Am I? Oh, go ahead, Alicia. Go you, ahead. You can hear me? Yeah, yeah. you have sound. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, hey. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that you have sound. I think we go ahead. You, you finally get to speak. We won't, we won't stop you. Oh, um, well, what I was going to say is that I remember being 14 and 15 and just came out to my mom and my friends. And I remember walking in Barnes and Noble and I'm like thinking I would love to find a book about a teenager who is becoming herself, who is coming out, who is discovering who she is or something of the sort. And I just remember like walking up and down the aisles over and over again. And I'm like, there's nothing here. Like there's no fiction book with a lesbian character, nothing. And I remember asking the person that works there, she was like, we have an LGBT section. And I'm like, why, mm -hmm. why, why do we need a section? Why can't we just be dispersed through all of the other fiction? I mean, nonfiction, what have you? Like, why can't we just be in the mix? So that's what I'm trying to do with my book is that it's literary fiction with lesbian characters. So that if somebody is walking in the bookstore and they're like, oh, this is fiction and it has lesbians in it and it's written by a queer person. Like, I can't wait. Like, I hope somebody finds my book and like gets that excited. Like, that's my goal. I think, I think that's a great goal. I think there's a practical issue involved, um, not only in, in, how, in how we reach our audience. I mean, I think this is a question that comes up constantly, and, and I don't want to talk too much about how we, how we market books, but if your readers can't find your book, then your message is not going to reach the people that you want to reach. I agree completely that our works deserve the same attention as mainstream works but we still struggle with our audience often not having access to our work and they need to be able to find us. And I think that that's why we need to still categorize in bookstores our works as LGBT fiction so that our readers can find them. As far as the target audience, I feel very strongly that we are writing queer fiction that features queer characters and queer lives. And part of our lives is our sexuality and the issues that that brings up in every level of our daily lives. How we love, how we deal with our relationships in the workplace, um, how we deal with the medical establishment as queers. So I think that our work absolutely needs to include our queerness. I think um, as far as like how much like the, the sexuality, I definitely believe that it should be there. Um, but also just to the extent that it's important to the story. Uh, the big thing that I, um, I think that some of this is generational too, which is why I think that there needs to be a bit of everything. Um, what I hear a lot, um, it's a really long story of why I see so much of, uh, some of it's my daughter, but some of it is because of some fandoms that I belong to. Um, I see a lot of, of, of young people, I say young people because I'm 45, um, talking about what they want to see represented in in their queer fiction. And they, I will see a lot, so some of them definitely want to see sensuality and sexuality, but some of them are really vocal about saying they want to see 
more some sweeter love stories just because they don't always want to see sexuality in there and they're they're speaking as queer people too and that i feel the the important thing is all should be represented because in the same way that straight people have the full gamut of everything queer people should have the same thing it's not that there's one right way or wrong way and it's that's that everything should be there and you should be able to have a buffet i definitely come down on the side that we should be shelved in the middle of everything but at the same time the bookstores there's like four of them left and so um i think that it's uh, most of people are buying online when they're buying gay fiction anyway and so they're looking at multiple categorizations there and if you're in an actual bookstore you're you're going to be asking the bookseller if it's a small bookstore or they're going to know you're going to say where where is the lesbian books and if it's a good bookstore they know how to lead you to it that's another thing that's really another issue and that's a deeper argument a deeper cut but um and that comes down to diversity in in fiction in general which is I mean, that's a whole nother podcast. I mean, but, um, but um, I mean, yeah, I think that, I think that the, to me, the biggest thing is everybody should get to have, to have themselves be seen in whatever way they want it. And so there's no right or wrong answer because there's lots of answers and they all are correct because in the same way that straight people have lots of answers, we should get the same privilege. Um, I want to go back and, and talk about sexuality in my books because I had I made some notes about some fun things, some challenges that we have as, um, as queer writers. We, we have to deal, in our books, we have to deal with the issue of gaydar because in the, in the straight world, the default is that everyone is straight. And so if you see a man you're attracted to and and you're a woman, then you don't have to do the dance of, well, is he attracted to women? But in queer fiction, there is the, that's the first hurdle you have to get over is, is, is this person that I'm interested in open to um, being interested in me? So that's uh, one issue we deal with, but then the other, and this is, this is a fun issue. It's, it's that we start each book with our characters. I start with my two women uh, with a blank slate in terms of the assumptions about their sexuality. Um, they might be a butch femme couple. They might be both butch characters. They might be both femme characters. And the portrayal is, um, it's something that I think that that my readers will identify with. I'm not necessarily each book, but I hope that I write enough that uh, readers will see themselves in something that I've written because I've written the kind of, perhaps the kind of character that they see themselves as with the kind of character they want to see themselves with. So. Um, that would be an idealized romance. And then the third issue that I wrote down that, uh, that we're probably all dealing with now is uh, consent with sexuality. So I just wanted to throw that out there just to bring that up. I think the other thing that is a draw for everyone when they read all LGBT romances that is what makes them attractive to everyone, no matter what their orientation. I think it's what draws people, especially to gay romances, but I wish people would stretch their boxes a little bit and look more into lesbian and the full spectrum, um, especially straight women. Um, there is so much, speaking specifically to the sexuality inside queer romances um there is so much feminism to be had when you look at a when you basically your every queer romance is attacking the patriarchy no matter what orientation it is because you're you're tearing down this establishment setup of how a relationship is supposed to be and 
that there is so much there's 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 fun in that there's aggression in that there's subversion in that and that is really delicious and awesome and great and people that's where the, the that's where all the draw to gay romance i swear comes from but there's a lot of great fun in lesbian romance in the same way that i really wish women would go now let go of all your misogyny and drive all the way home but um but that i think is something that is really worth mentioning as well because that is there we don't talk about it a ton but it's it's not something you think about when you pick up like i'm going to take apart the patriarchy today while i read my romance but you really are so it's there yeah, I just wanted to add a comment to what Heidi was saying earlier. I don't think that sexuality in our work is the same thing as sex in our work. We don't have to have graphic sex scenes for our work to embody the sexuality of being queer. Yes. And I think that's what that's what really matters. Is yeah. that, that for the you know, for the queer individual, being queer is a twenty four hour a day thing. And it's it it's part of every single thing that we do every single day. It's not about just having sex. And sure, there are going to be romances that are sweet romances. There are going to be erotic romances that are filled with sex. And those are the kind of things that allow our readers to find the kinds of works that they're looking for. But every work that speaks to queer lives needs to think about and address our sexuality because that's the world we live in. And that's those are the the issues that we deal with all the time. So that, that was the point I was trying to make earlier. So um, Tuesday, um, no, Monday night, I made the horrible mistake of sending excerpts from my book to my daughter's Girl Scout mom's messaging Facebook chat. And these ex excerpts contain lesbian sex and crystal meth use so you can only imagine the horror that i experienced whenever one of them posted uh this isn't girl scout room appropriate and i screamed and threw my phone because i was mortified so our first meeting was on tuesday first time meeting all of these girls and i'm like oh my god so i walk in there and i'm like i wonder what they're thinking of me right now after reading what i just sent them and two of them came up to me on separate occasions and said, I want to read your book. That was kind of hot. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I was so excited. I'm like, not only are you married to a man in a heterosexual relationship, my book turned you on. And I'm like, yeah, I got so excited. And I'm like, everybody needs to just embrace their sexuality and just, I don't know. So that was like a total win, even though it was in extremely embarrassing. Subversive but marketing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not in my favor, good, oddly though. enough. <laughs> That's really fantastic. We've actually got some questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask one of them before we continue with our own questions. And one of them is from Dylan Cross, who is also an author. And he is saying, I'm wondering if the LGBT genre encounters hurdles in marketing via so social media like Facebook. For instance, do they give you a hassle when running advertising? Have any of you had this kind of an issue? I know that uh, I think Dylan said something about he works with the Erotic Authors Guild, but still, sometimes people get blocked. Have you noticed this issue before? I haven't had any trouble. I, I mean, I do I haven't either. promote all of my works on, on my Facebook page, but I don't use specific Facebook ads. So I can't really speak to that. I haven't had any problem with my internal Facebook. I've used ads and I haven't had trouble, but I also, my covers are all, I don't have any covers that have any, anything that would trip the, triggers and i've heard more trouble with with heterosex with authors of heterosexual romance that have um revealing covers or that aren't even revealing i say uh so i think i can't speak to that on any social media um i think it depends on how on how you market and what you say and also 
it it really just depends. It also depends on if you attract the wrong attention and the wrong person decides to start going around and reporting everything you're doing. I mean, if you're following their rules, you are probably safe, but then their rules are, are arbitrary, just change all the time. And all it takes is, you know, if you, can, I mean, I'm pretty careful about, I look at who I friend and so it's harder for someone to come in rep and report things, but I mean, I know some people have had trouble, but I don't know that I can say that there are people that have had trouble because of LGBT issues. I've actually, um, I have never paid for a marketing ad on Facebook, but between like from my followers and just everybody like, like me reaching out to the, the lesbians and the queers they have all like got behind my book and they help me share. And like, it is this amazing thing that I'm watching my book spread around the world, but I've never like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to like run an actual ad on Facebook because of what could happen. Like this, this, the discrimination, I don't know, but so far I, I haven't experienced it. So I call that a win. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, that that's really good. Um, I'm going to ask one more question from the chat before we get back to our regular questions. We do have a couple of questions which uh, are really good ones. So um, I'm going to ask one from Joe from Go Indy Now. If you don't know his show, um, check him out on YouTube. He has a wonderful show um, that has many, many different kinds of um, interviews and things like that. So his question is, what's missing in LGBTQ fiction that you would like to see more authors tackle? Uh, and what is the next evolution in your own writing? It's an interesting one. I like that. There are no trans characters. Yeah, not not. And, and if there are, there trans are some. Characters, but... There are some. I haven't. Like the more people that are able to, like they feel brave enough to come out, to be them true selves in a world that tells them to be anything and everything but themselves. I feel like they are so misunder under uh, that word I can't think of right now, but they're just not seen enough in literature and. I'm going to tackle that in my next book. We'll have a uh, secondary main character and he will be a trans man. So I'm going to break that one down too. I was on the uh, Lambda Literary Board for six years when we first started um, trying to drum up submissions for transgender books. And at one point they were part of LGBT categories. And then, um, and then we tried to, to solicit books on, uh, for an awards category in just transgender topics. And we had fiction and nonfiction and poetry all aggregated in one category. And then um, I left the board last year and by that time we were giving out awards in transgender fiction and transgender nonfiction, and in transgender poetry so we have seen those categories grow quite a bit um they could always grow more but um but trans people are and they're they're part of our lives and they probably could show up a lot more in our books as our friends uh, if we're not writing main characters, they they could come through our lives, come through our books the way they come through our lives. I Just, totally agree. We we um, sorry Heidi, go ahead. No, go ahead. We we have published uh, trans books. We have an intersex book. I'm writing the f fifth book in a series that has a prominent trans teen a in a subplot who shows up in every book and is is a favorite with readers. But I agree, there there aren't enough. And it's a question of getting authors to write them. And also, I think, educating the audience, the readers, that this is something they can identify with. I think that that's always a problem when readers say, this isn't me. I don't know anything about this. Um, this isn't a book that will speak to me. And I think it's an ongoing process. And we, we need to continue to write and publish these works. 
we definitely need to see more um, characters of color that are also LGBT. And preferably we need more authors of color writing these books. I think that it's important that white authors who are writing LGBT books include diverse characters in all aspects, both queer characters and um, characters of color. But what we really need is representation from authors of color in those. And there, they, there are authors writing these books. And so what I would like to see within the community is I would like to see much, much, much more. And I'm going to speak to my own people right now for any of them listening. Um, I would like to see, especially in the gay romance community, I would like to see more and more and more networking within, across, more lifting up of these authors of color so that they get seen and of the authors of color who are writing queer romance. And um, I cannot speak for what is going on outside of, of my corner of the queer universe, but I am always happy to lift up anyone anywhere in any of the queer universe, but especially I'm always ready to lift up an author of color because they're, it just, it cannot be done enough. And because we need more of it written, we need more of it lifted up and more of it sh shouted out because there is a huge disparity in, I always see authors of color and in, in romance in general lifting up gay romance, and I don't see it turned back the other way nearly enough. And so as much of that can be rectified, that would be great. That's what I see the most that I would like to see changed. Yeah, and I do want to bring up that um, KG actually, if if you want to go over to her blog, she has a really great post where she talks about the fact that um, TV shows, uh, even though we have Amazon and Netflix and, and places that can go sort of outside of regular television and do maybe more, maybe push the envelope more on what's typically included in television, um, they're making their own shows and um, there's still a lot missing on TV. So in terms of diver diversity and so, um, not everyone is really able to find what they're looking for and what makes them comfortable. So uh, her blog post really was a great reminder that books are what fill those gaps. And like sitting here tonight, even though we're saying really we could use more diversity in this way and that way, and we'd like to see more of this and that, um, there is so much more in fiction. So if you are someone who watches a lot of TV and feels underrepresented, definitely check out these authors' books because I feel like you will feel much better represented and more comfortable. Um, so I just wanted to make sure uh, uh, that we got that out there. Um, but moving on from that, um, I wondered in particular about young adult fiction and LGBTQ fiction. Um, do you think that there's anything that YA fiction in that category needs uh, in order to support young adults in particular properly. They're a lot of times struggling with coming out or um, even admitting to themselves, you know, how they feel. So I wondered what you all thought. Um, there's a, the number one thing that I see and hear is from, from young people, young queer people is that in, in addition to the coming out stories, which are always, you know, the, those are always great, they would like to hear more simple, normal, like everyday stories about queer people, because it doesn't always have to be about the struggle of coming out. It's not that those aren't needed. Those are definitely needed because you want to be able to, you know, help see yourself as you work through your own coming out. But coming out for some kids isn't as difficult as it is for others and what they want to just see is and sometimes part of coming out and ease of coming out is just seeing yourself normalized and being existing without having it be a struggle especially i see a lot of times when straight authors write queer people especially in ya it's always fixated on the um coming out aspect and that's fine but there's a lot that's gone beyond the coming out. And it's, it's there, there's, that's the thing that I would agree with as well, that there's, let's step beyond just coming out. No, oh, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. We've published a lot of gay and lesbian YA fiction. And the, the ones that are the most popular are the ones about high school life, about mm -hmm. Queer kids in high school dealing with all the issues that high school kids deal with, not just 
coming out. Sometimes it is coming out, but a lot of times it's just dating or gender identity um, or how to express themselves or how to, you know, how to deal with the things that kids deal with. So I think that in a sense, normalizing the queerness of that age is really an important message. Sure, we still have to talk, we still have to deal with coming out and it's not always easy. And there are lots of kids who, you know, are ostracized from their families. And those are important issues to deal with too. But we also have to show queer kids being young adults and starting to deal with life the way we all had to deal with it. Everyone agree? Alicia? Is is your stuff messing up over there? Like, is it skipping? Um, yours is skipping a little, mine but mine is skipping really you. bad, and like, it's like keeps going in and out. Oh, I wonder if your connection is not so good. Mm. I'm gonna sign off, and hopefully, I will be back because I need to check the router. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. KG, what do so, you think? Well, I think with in terms of uh, why needs, and I'll just go back and touch on this uh, urban rural divide again. I think that it's, I think that it's really huge in. I don't think um, you can say that enough. So, yeah. And um, and I think that teens and young adults are looking for um, inspiration in what they read. Um, maybe more than than uh, older readers are that um, that being able to show them a path um, an example of someone who went through the same struggle they're facing who um, who survived who got um, who grew and and uh, found the the life they needed to be living, but also I just, I have always thought that the best thing I could have had would have been a book that I could have shared with my straight friends. This is the book I That's want you good. to read to understand me. And, um, and I couldn't begin to even tell you what that book was like. I, I know I couldn't write it, but, um, but for those people who are writing YA, I think uh, I think those are definitely themes that um, that occupy them. These are great answers, really great answers. Um, I want to skip over to the chat for a moment and ask a question from Jessica. Thanks for your question. She says, uh, why can't we have mass market paperbacks in the grocery store with same sex characters on the cover being presented alongside the typical hetero romances with windswept Fabio? <laughs> is it a distribution issue or is it a lack of publishers willing to take the risk with the lack of audience? Oh, can I answer that one? Please do. Um, well, as, as a publisher, boy, I would love that. Number one, mass market paperbacks are not going to happen. Sorry. Amber alert. Girl, um, because mass market paperbacks uh, require a very, very large printing in order to actually be economically feasible to print. Uh, so that's probably almost that's probably never going to happen unless there's some breakout work that's going to that's going to um, sell more than fifty thousand, hundred thousand copies. So actually, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because actually, yep. Dream Spinner is doing a little bit of that because I don't know they have some deal and they're not in drug stores, but they are in some stores. So uh, it's in small, well, smaller increments. Well, it's happening, but under some some circumstances, but. Uh, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm only speaking to mass market paperbacks. I mean, the, no, the, they I, are mass market. They're just really? like, yeah, okay. they're mass market, like seven dollar ones. OK, that's great to hear. Um, but it's I mean, it, it's not like 50,000 print runs. It's, yeah. it's smaller print runs, but it's like under a special deal. But but trade paperbacks, which is what most of us are publishing our print in, which are the slightly larger books, which are lower print runs can get picked up and have been picked up in airports 
um, even in Walmart, but it's, it is a distribution issue because the reps don't buy the books. And that's something we just have to keep working on and showing that if people buy them, we'll be able to use those distribution channels. It's always a question of demand. And it's going to take some of this to change is going to take something like getting bookstores and distributors to this is the same for all books of all diverse stripes to get them to say, hey, you know what, it's important to have this representation in places. And so we're going to make the decision to do this. And we're going to, it's going to take think places like Ingram or whoever is printing books for people to say, yeah, we're going to make these deals for these people, which right now I can't see that possibly happening, but I mean, it would take something like that to make that happen. Or if you have like, like the, I have, I have some books coming out next year that through Dream Spinner Press that are going to be in mass market, but it's not mass market. Like that it's going to be in everybody's grocery store. I mean, that's like a big, that's a huge different deal. But, and even books that come out mass market through some of the big publishers aren't that are, uh, there's some LGBT books that have been mass market that it's not, they're not going to be in your grocery store. Um, but there you can, you can make, you can get that some distributed places a little bit better than others, but yeah, it's until you get a whole bunch of people buying LGBT romance, it's not going to happen. And the thing is, it's a catch 22 until a whole bunch of people start buying LGBT romance. We're not going to have that happen. And so when you see some books like love Simon and things that have a lot of big press around them, there's a little bit of an, a blip and you think, Oh, maybe everything will change. But, that's not really how publishing works because it's not like everybody says, Oh no, I'm going to read all the queer romance. There is, they read the one book and that's just how publishing goes. They might, some people read some more books, but not all the people. Um, there's people that read hits and they only read hits. And, but so if you want to see mass market books, you have to get all your friends to go buy all the queer books. And I don't think you have that kind of money. So but hopefully we can get to a point though, publishing changing that just the way distribution happens changes. And I mean, look at the changes that happened the last 20 years alone, the last 10 years alone. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next five. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to try to predict it. I have seen uh, articles out there, blog posts, but also formal articles by bigger places saying specifically that when they do look, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, probably multiples, actually, maybe all of you mentioned this earlier, um, when they do go to like a Barnes and Noble or wherever, it's very hard to find um, what you're looking for. And there's like a smattering of popular fiction, but you really can't get like, you know, what you're really looking for new, different, um, just the runs the gamut diverse that you're really looking for because it's too scant of a section. And so, like you said, it's a catch 22. People want to, they want to buy it. They're just, you need to do like a big marketing push probably. So people even knew it was there. They've been waiting so long now, probably. Um, but I do have, um, thank you for that. I do have uh, another really great question in the chat. You guys are asking amazing questions. Um, so I would like to throw this out there to you. Um, Cheyenne, thank you for asking this, says, uh, from a cisgender author working on representation in fantasy, what is the best way to have characters that don't stereotype LGBTQ people and issues? A little bit tough. <laughs> Maybe too broad. I don't know. Um, if I'm interpreting it right, the question is how to write LGBTQ characters who are not stereotypical, mm -hmm. who aren't demonstrating what we would consider to be stereotypical characteristics. Um, I think this is always a really difficult issue when you, whenever you're writing characters who aren't your own experience. And one way I think that's always good to do that is to talk to people who, who do have that experience and ask them, how do you feel in this situation? Or how would you react if this were going to happen, if this happened to you? So that actually talking to people who have had the experience, I think helps avoid stereotypical reactions. Um, I, I also think that um, writing queer characters when you're not queer is, is always a challenge. But I think that the thing to remember is that queers in general are, a struggle with the same kinds of issues that everyone else does. 
And that's important to show. It's not always about dealing with one's sexuality. It's important to have that. I mean, queers are, we're queer because we are different in terms of our sexuality and our gender identity. But it's not always just about that. It's also about intimacy and commitment and how we deal with the stresses of life. So those things have to be demonstrated as well so that you have well-rounded characters. A really I get, I'm sorry, I was okay. to, you, well, no, you go ahead. because I, I, was, I was just going to uh, perhaps give some practical advice, uh, and that would be that as you're outlining the book, hide the character's sexuality and write the character that you know is the character, and then at some point decide when you're going to reveal that character's sexuality, because if that... Um, if that character is is already uh, formulated in the head of a reader, and they learn later about sexuality, then there there would be less uh, less thought of stereotyping. But when you introduce a character right off the bat, and you say this person is gay, or this person is lesbian, and then you start to assign characteristics to them that that might be um, confirming stereotypes, then, then those are the things that will stick in the head of the reader as they go through the book. Whereas if they don't know that off the bat, then they'll see a much more um, multi-dimensional character. One of my greatest surprises in, in, um, in fiction, and, and it's with movies and with, um, and with TV shows, or when characters come out, when, or when they are suddenly revealed to go in and um, and he goes and he kisses the man or she goes and she kisses the woman and like we didn't know that and um, and we got fixed in our head uh, a whole a whole character at that point so that's just my practical advice and following up on that with excellent advice and following up on that even more practical advice, I strongly recommend, and this is for anyone looking to um, write about characters other than themselves, a book called Writing the Other, A Practical Approach. It's by Nissi Shaw and Cynthia Ward. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it directly on their website. They also teach classes. Um, sometimes they go from the very short classes to very long, like weekend long ones. Um, they teach them online. Um, you follow them on uh, social media as well. But um, it's a very short book um, full of exercises and just to help you get outside your head. And uh, they include uh, LGBT characters in there as well. But it's just anybody who's not yourself is there, who's not like you is their, is their theme. And it's just to, to teach you how to stop stereotyping, basically, and to, to challenge you as to like how you're thinking and everything like that. So it's, a, it's just an excellent book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Yeah, I've been to the website. It's a terrific website, and they've got they they address lots of issues that you frequently see. You know, issues of color and how to how to how to talk about characters of color and queer characters and many other things. And so the website is right up there, and it's free, so it's great. That's a fantastic resource. Um, I wanted to bring up something I saw on Book Riot, and that is an article where the author said, and this is a quote, I don't want every book with queer characters to be a festival of unending sadness and suffering. So a list of LGBTQ plus books that actually end on a positive note can be what we need. So that's the quote from the article. And my question to you is, do you think that there's an imbalance in LGBTQ fiction toward the negative side instead of the positive side? And if you do find that the case, why do you think that's so? No, I strongly disagree with that. I mean, I, I could give you 1,200 books that have positive affirming endings. You can go to our website and look at anything we publish. I'm glad to hear that because that, that was <laughs> when I saw that, I said, oh, no. <laughs> Well, I think when they're talking about that, they're they're talking about what is popularly conceived. If you're a romance reader, um, you know right where to go. There's there is all kinds of books, and you you know where to get the good story. Um, but if you if you write off romance as something that you can that you can that you re if you say romance is trash, as some people do, then there then that does begin to limit what the positive stories are. Um, I think, I think um, 
some of this too is colored by just popular um, that in, I think, I think there are more positive stories than people are giving credit for. And a lot of it is because people are discounting romance. Um, I think also to some of this is carryover because there are not enough positive stories in the media. It, 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 books are included in media, but because in media as a whole, there are not as many, if you're still, if you're talking television and movies and um, even anime, there are not nearly, if there's queer characters and it, there's not as many happy endings. Um, and I I told somebody online I was going to bring this up. And so here it is. So, <laughs> but um, the, one of the things I'm watching right now is online. Um, I'm watching people's reactions on social media because I cannot bear to watch the show. There is a, um, I watch a ton of anime, just a ton of anime and read manga. And I really enjoy reading um, uh, a, um, all I, I really enjoy re reading Asian representations of queer pers queer um, fiction and both in print and in um, visual because it's it's the same and different at the same time and just from from a headspace that, that really that really gets me into interesting places. But the one I can't do is Banana Fish. It's a manga and now it's an anime and the anime is coming into the end and it just has. It's so, it gets so dark. There's some really amazing, great moments and people are watching it now and they keep showing, I watch the feeds because there's some cute little snippets and I like the pictures, but they, they, they just watched some episode. I think today it came out and they're all wrecked because it's got some just dark, dark themes. And I spoiled myself on the end. So that, and that's why I'm not watching because it's a really dark end. And I think that, some of this response becomes colored because there's people want more film. They want more TV. They want more visual. The, 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 I mean, not the books aren't sexy, but people consider the visual media sometimes a little, little, little more sexy and out there than, than books are. They're the ones that get more views than books. And so I think people, I think spill that over, but, in the meantime, people should be reading the books because if you want a happy end, I mean, it's littered all over the floor in a book. Uh, so that's that's where I, my perspective is, I think, where some of that's coming from. Yeah, because I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that we don't see enough in the media in general, in broad media, that represents queerness in a positive way. I, I, it's not just romances in queer fiction that have positive characters and positive right. you know, stories. Um, yeah, obviously, if you're reading a romance, you're probably going to have a positive ending. You better have a positive ending. But, you know, there are mysteries in sci-fi and, mm -hmm. and general fiction and plenty of stories that show queer characters overcoming obstacles, whether no matter what it is. But again, it's books. Yeah. And, 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 and what I what I see in. Actors. When I see in, in especially watching like, like this banana fish is just the best example because everybody knows it's going to have a bad ending. And they know they don't, there's people who don't want it to have a bad ending. And they keep hoping, even though they, it makes no sense, that somehow the ending is going to be different. It's like, why would they change the ending of the story? The manga has a negative ending. It's an older story. And they're just bringing it out. And they're putting it to, they're putting, making it animated just because it, it hasn't, they didn't do it before because there was no way that would ever make it. Through, you know, Japan would never have done it. And now Japan is doing it. And that's a big thing. But they're so hungry for a queer story that they're watching the story that they know is going to make them really sad because they just want to see a queer story. Yeah. And if there is any animated queer anything, it is the most popular thing ever because people are so hungry for it. I'm like, then let's make some happy ones. I'm like, let me tell you, there's like so many, there's so much material. It's like, it's everywhere. Just pick one up and make it. But you know let's get you know it, it's 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 a universal problem both asia and western producers of the things are still having the same issue so i'm not sure what is wrong with all of the visual producers but they all have the same disease <laughs> i don't think it's i don't think it's unique to um to queer fiction though i think that there is a um uh, we see the parallel in in Hollywood movies versus indie movies. Uh, the Hollywood movie is, uh, is formulaic. It's, 
it's got mass market appeal, it's it's a happy ending romance, or it's uh, a hero movie where um, an indie an indie film is going to uh, tackle tougher issues, and it uh, and it may be character focused in a in a different way, and and we see the same thing between literary fiction versus genre fiction, where I think genre fiction, you do find a lot of heroes and a lot of happy endings, and you don't necessarily find those same characters in literary fiction. I think it also comes down to, to volume and and the, whether or not you're doing tokenism, which is, I think, a lot of times it, it can be in some, lit, if, especially if it's, if it's a queer author or someone who really gets the queer experience and they're writing, or if it's, if you're lucky enough to have it be in a visual media and they're doing this, they're, they might do it well. But if, if you're saying, oh, I should have some diversity, I'll put a gay character in there and, or, or, or no, I'll do an, I'll even do a transgender character. I'll do a non-binary character. And if you're just putting them in there and you don't try to say, oh, there's one, we have one, or ooh, there's a, there's a gay character and a lesbian character, but you don't think I should make them the main character and not make it about their coming out or whatever. Just like, it's a story about, it's a fantasy story and the character happens to be gay. And we're not even necessarily gonna, they're not necessarily even gonna fall in love. It's just, by the way, they're gay. And we don't even, I mean, that's not, nobody even thinks of that. It's like, well, they're gay, we better get them a boyfriend, you know, or they're, they're a lesbian, where's the, you know, we there's not there's that's not even like on anybody's headspace and so when when we see these characters and we see ourselves we go I'm so excited we're I'm there we're there and so then anything happens to these characters like anything bad everybody's like you can't do that because I'm finally there leave them alone and so I think that's some of it too it's that there's no representation. So when there is somebody there, it's like, don't touch them because you finally got us on the door, leave them alone. But that's also not great for character development either. And so if you're gonna, you know, you have to have more richness of experience as well. You can't just have one or two representation and then just, you know, that's not how it works. It doesn't work for straight people that way, so. Right. Definitely. I have, I hope um, if it's okay with you guys, I have just two more questions I'd like to ask. Um, and that will be, one is from uh, the chat and it's a great question. It is, um, do you guys have any tips that you think an emerging author who is writing their first book with a main LGBT, with main LGBT characters could use um, for someone just, you know, like I said, an emerging author? Just one tip. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> throw them out there. Any anything you have, I think it's a great question. Well, if if you want to, if you want to write, you have to write. So, um, that's. I mean, that's what I would tell any any beginning. Um, writer is just to keep writing, keep looking at it, keep reading, write it again, write it again, write it again, and, um, and tell your story, get it on paper, then you're a writer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think it's important to know what you're writing and to know why you're writing it, to have a sense of what your story is and where it's going. And I think the most important thing is that you have to put yourself in it. I think that the thing that, that we see that often lets a story fall flat is the emotional aspects. And that's because you don't reveal your own fears and weaknesses and hopes and desires. So if you're going to write, you're going to have to put yourself in it. Yeah. You, if you're, I, I've, I've gotten to the point where, if somebody's hesitant, I would say, well, if you can, if you cannot write, then you probably shouldn't. And if that makes them mad, then I'm like, well, then good. You probably should be writing because if you can, it, it, writing's hard work and it's frustrating and an, a lonely business. And so if you really want to do it, then you should do it. But if you're wishy-washy about it, then maybe wait till your, your teeth are aching for it. Because, <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't get any better. 
<laughs> and I do um, just want to once again bring attention to KG's earlier answer about outlining and how helpful that can be to just um, draw everything together first and then figure out where other things might fit in. Oh. I very much uh, liked that advice, so I just want to make sure everyone remembers that that was said. Um, I outline and I outline all the time, and I don't use my outlines most of the yeah. time, but they're good. Um, they're good touch points sometimes. That's good. I'm a pantser myself. So am I. <laughs> I yeah, are you? That's okay. great. I liked a, a fair Sean said uh, somebody I wasn't at the event but so, they, somebody quoted her on Twitter and I thought it was great. I was a pantser until someone showed me this thing called a deadline. <laughs> I thought <laughs> that's true. I'm still a pantser but all of a sudden it's like wait I should probably map this out a bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Absolutely. And if you guys don't mind, I just want to ask you if there is any LGBTQ book conference or writing conference that you would recommend um, that you like or that you've been to that you feel really represents well, even if it's not specifically LGBTQ, just to give our audience places that they can look to attend. If there's anything in particular. If not, that's okay. <laughs> For a reader con or a writer con? Really either. I, I think there's a couple. Um, I think that the the Golden Crown Literary Society is an is an organization that helps to um, support and sponsor lesbian fiction. They hold an annual conference. There's a pretty good program of di uh, sessions, workshop sessions, teaching. It's also reader oriented. Uh, Saints and Sinners is a is a fifteenth fifth going into the. 15th year now in New Orleans, which is a queer literary festival with both gay and it's more mixed, uh, not just lesbian. So there's a couple. And um, I think that we're starting to see better representation in organizations like the RWA. I've been on a couple panels there. Um, so I think that we, I think the most important thing for us is to actually start to see more LGBTQ representation in mainstream literary um venues but there are some yeah, i'm not a big con girl i try to stay home as much as possible but um when i do go i go to the rwa and i'm very active in rwa and um i had in the past gone to rt and which is now it is not necessarily the same thing but i am going to attend book lovers con it's brand new so run by the same people so i guess it's rt-esque so we'll see, but um, I have high hopes for that. Like there's um, like Dr um, Dream Spinner Press is there and like there's a ton of LGBT authors going there. And I know that they're always open to more so that if there were, I don't know how, if there's any lesbian authors going, but if a lesbian author said, hey, we want to go, I know that they would say, next year we're totally going to make place for you because I know that's how they're thinking that their diversity is super important to them. So. I, I know the people who are putting it together. So I, I know that diversity of all aspects is one of their most important things that, that they believe in. So in, before the, the publishers, the readers, the authors attending. So I would recommend attending that as a reader if you are interested in just checking it out. And, and um, I will be there next year. And that's probably the only con I'm going to. So, but those are mine. Oh, okay. Um, I would, um, I'll echo what Radcliffe said about the GCLS, but I'll also bring up um, not only conferences, but retreats. I would encourage anyone who was, um, who's embarking on um, a writing career to, to get in a, get in a writer group and try to try to get to a retreat um and i'll mention that lambda literary has each year they have a um a retreat for emerging lgbt voices in um southern california they with terrific faculty they have um they have several tracks they have a fiction track they have a genre track they have a poetry um playwright, trans, um, transgender track. So if you are a, an LGBT 
if you're a queer writer and you're just starting out and you want to um, and you want to have the experience of a lifetime, I encourage you to apply to this workshop, to this retreat. And if you don't get in, apply next year and then apply the year after that. It's, I have never heard anyone come out of it who had anything other than than the ultimate praise for it and and they made friends for life and it was uh it was just the most wonderful experience justin torres wrote his book we the animals starting out starting at the that retreat that sounds like a particularly great one Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for staying after. And to our audience, thank you so much for the questions. They were really fantastic. And all of you were wonderful. Um, let's go down the line um, the opposite way that I did then I did the introductions. So you can tell us where we can find you online and on social media. Uh, let's start with you, Radcliffe. Uh, Facebook, uh, Radcliffe BSB, and also uh, boldstrokesbooks.com. All my books are there and uh, you can find us there. Fantastic. And next, KG, please. Um, I'm on Facebook, KG McGregor. I also have a website, kgmcgregor.com, and I show up every now and then in the Bella blog, which is the blog run by Bella Books. Great. And finally, Heidi. Um, I'm on Twitter as Heidi Cullinan and Facebook as Heidi Cullinan. Not very, you know. And um, I am on Tumblr as Cullen and Katsudon. I mostly talk about anime there. So if you got excited when I mentioned anime, that's where to go. Uh, Instagram, but mostly that's cats and food. Uh, and that's Heidi Cullen and also. Great. And I know Alicia, who was here with us earlier, you can find her on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I believe she's under Rebel Writer or Rebel 143. So you can look for her there and at Rediscue Publishing. And as for The Writer's Edge, of course, you can find us right here. You can also find us at thewritersedgeshow.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook as well. And that is a group that you can join so you can see all our latest updates. Um, as for me, Christy Stratus, you can find me at christystratus.com. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Creative Edge Writers Showcase, and many more places. And our next episode, we are actually going to skip one we would normally do because it would fall on Thanksgiving. So we won't have one at the end of the month, but we will have one in December. So please join us again then. And we'll probably do a, a wonderful audience suggested panel, which is how, do, how does everyone deal with the release of a new book? I think that's a fantastic topic. So we'll probably be back with that. Again, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you to all the panelists who did a really fantastic job and we will see you next time thank you